Hi, this is Helen Jolet. You can find my music on bandcamp.com. And you are listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Nowhere in the world celebrates modernism better than Modernism Week in Palm Springs, California. Every February, for a week that actually lasts 11 days, they have an architecture and design festival. And U.S. Modernist Radio is there for all 11 days of the week, interviewing nearly all of Modernism Week's keynote speakers, plus special guests. It all happens at the U.S. Modernist Compound. That would be poolside at the hip Hotel Skylark. If you're in the mid-century modernism, Modernism Week is a joyous festival of mid-century architecture and a whole bunch of other cool things. I'm Tom Guild. George and I love Modernism Week because it brings so many clever and creative people together for exhibits, walking tours, and the kind of lectures you never got in college. There is a critical mass of creativity out there in the desert at Palm Springs. And in fact, this year, someone was awarded status as an honorary National AIA member. That would be our host, George Smart. Hey, thank you, Tom. I was really thrilled to get this honor from the National AIA. It's been such a pleasure to work with so many architects uh, the last 15 years in putting together their history of their residential work primarily all around the country. Sometimes it's a it's a Scooby Doo mystery to be solved. <laughs> sometimes it's just moving massive amounts of data from one place to another, and sometimes it's driving through the night to an abandoned storage unit to try to rescue records and slides and blueprints and things like that so they don't get thrown away. Modernism Week is just a blast. When modern day Jedi Knights use the Force, they don't use it to go to Tatooine. They land inside Bob Hope's massive John Lautner house in Palm Springs that we hope to be in one day. Right. If you'd like to go with me and Tom to Modernism Week in 2023, email me at george at usmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs, and by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. In a timeless adventure that we are completely making up, realtor Angela Roll grew up in Estonia, the daughter of a former ambassador wrongly accused of spying on next-door Lithuania. He was cleared, it turns out, because Estonia only has six spies, and everybody pretty much knows who they are. After a night of partying with Le Corbusier's cousin, Boozy Corbusier, Angela took the ferry across the gulf to Finland, causing an international incident involving a little red dress, a wood-turning lathe, the Finnish Coast Guard, and a $2,400 bar tab she accidentally signed over to Bjork. Uh Uh-oh. Angela escaped the resulting media frenzy on a train to Denmark in the company of international man of mystery, Eric of Arhos, whom she later married. Angela then moved to North Carolina to become a real estate agent. Specializing in modernist houses, Angela advises buyers and sellers on everything, from appropriate renovation to shipping a wood-turning lathe from Helsinki. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com, that's R-O-E-H-L, or call 919-995-0550. The development of four-lane highways and interstates in the 50s and 60s created a huge surge in car travel. In a time before the minivan, families would pile into the station wagon or the Airstream and hit the road to discover America. Roadside motels sprung up everywhere, as we discussed with past podcast guest Heather David, author of Motel California. And the car culture just exploded. Sports cars like the wildly famous Mustang defined cool, and nothing was better than to drive around L.A. or Palm Springs or anywhere, really, in a cool car. Today, we explore cars and trailers and modernism with three guests. Susan Skarsgård, a former design manager for General Motors. Tom Dahl and Jeff Stork, authors of Glamour Road, Color, Fashion, Style, and the Mid-Century Automobile. And returning podcast guest, Eric Bricker, producer of Illumination, 
a film about the iconic Airstream travel trailer. First up, author Susan Skarsgård was a design manager at General Motors and had many other titles, including designer, calligrapher, author, and archivist. She is known internationally for original fine art and her expertise on the role of design in the auto industry, especially at GM. Susan is the author of Where Today Meets Tomorrow, Aero Saarinen and the General Motors Technical Center. And now here's George Smart talking with Susan Skarsgård in Palm Springs. Susan, when people think of cars, they think of models and engines and tires and all those pieces and parts to make the cars work, but a lot of why they buy the car is its design, even down to the lettering that's on the cars. And that's something you know a lot about. That is something I know a lot about. I uh, worked at General Motors in the department that does that very thing which is design the jewelry that defines the vehicle's division and model and things like that. So yes, that's an area that I have quite a bit of deep knowledge with. So this goes all the way from like the top part of it, like from GM as a brand to like the brands of the divisions of GM. Yes. And then you have like families of cars sometimes, right? Yes. And then you have the cars themselves. Yes. And then you have like certain things inside the cars. Sure. Right? Mm Mm-hmm. So pick a car that has that family tree and tell us about that lineage. Well, typically there is not much identity on the vehicle that identifies it as the corporation, General Motors. So there might be some top-level General Motors identity that might be in the engine or things like that. But typically, a car is identified by its division. So in this case, Buick, Chevrolet, Cadillac, GMC. Those are the four that are currently the major divisions at General Motors. So from there, you go on to the models, the specific models within that division, And then each model has different designations to support its specific model attributes. And, I mean, these are things that people don't even really consider, but somebody has to design those things. Yeah. Right? Right. Yeah. So if you step back and look inside your car and outside your car with this awareness, you'll realize that there's a tremendous amount of identity and information that is just inherent in a vehicle from the instrumentation panel with all the graphics that support the information for you to be able to drive the vehicle effectively, all the way down to the identity and the overall information that is both safety-related and brand-related. And then, of course, what happens there translates to all the sales and marketing materials to yes. get generated. Yes, it does. However, there is a pretty distinct difference between the what is the corporate identity group, which is General Motors specific folks that are designing these things. Okay. And then the advertising agencies that support the brands are really an external thing to the company. So the company directs their work, but it's not within General Motors. So sometimes the ad agencies are are very attentive to what design cues have been set for the vehicles and models, and other times not so much. So it, it's always a push-pull. Our department at GM was always, you know, trying to influence the thinking of the ad agency so it was a seamless operation, but we weren't always successful with that. How does it work in terms of chronology? Does a group like yours get involved in the very, very early stages where they're designing the car, or do they design the car first and then you come in and kind of help assign an identity to it? You know, it works differently with each car. I mean, some cars are really defined right at the beginning from a conceptual idea. And so sometimes those conceptual ideas are, you know, have ideation done with the identity early on. Probably more typically, the car is pretty well established in terms of its aesthetics by the time identity is considered and rendered for the vehicle. And I've always wondered how they name the cars, how they decide on 
a name. It seems that for a while they just picked a random wild animal. Yeah. <laughs> and and said, okay, that's going to be it. It's going to be the cheetah yes. for 2022. Yeah. But how does how does that happen? Is it focus groups? Is it? You know, again, you might want to think. We would all want to think this is a very lineal. Um, you Rational know, uh, process. Yes. Yeah. So let's not go there. <laughs> like each car, in my experience, sort of had a different path. And certain brands had different ways that they dealt with identity and naming and things like that. Sometimes a naming firm would be em- employed and come in and help out with that kind of thing. Other times the ad agency would be the primary source. And sometimes it would be some executive's wife. So, oh, yes, that can happen. Yes. So, Spouses name a lot of things. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, it isn't something where there's one way fits all. You know, they're constantly evolving the way, just like in politics, you know, people take over and they run it the way they want to run it. And it's the same thing with car companies and divisions and how it happens. It's not a line- lineal, rational process. Now, you've spent a lot of time in the General Motors Technical Center. Yes. Which was designed by Eero Saarinen, one of his most iconic projects. Yes. One of the things that people talk about all the time that that visit, and I haven't had a chance to visit yet, is just still today, uh, even though it's, what, how 60 years old now? Yes, yeah. About 60? It opened in 1956. Okay. How it still looks like the future, and Mm -hmm. it looks like... You know, the the world is just right around the corner for us to discover. Yes. Uh, Pretty amazing. Yeah, I think that's probably the most amazing thing about the campus and how successful it was that Eero Cernan was able to design a flexible structure, series of structures for a corporation to grow, move, change, and still hold on to the big idea of uh, aesthetics on the campus. So for our listeners who are a little bit younger, what are some of the models that GM put out in the 50s and 60s that came out of the Technical Center? Well, I would just call them like the divisional models. I mean, it's kind of hard to describe a 1957 Chevy Bel Air convertible would have been designed at the Tech Center and released there at that time. All of the 50s vehicles and divisions, Oldsmobile, that was the center for design, engineering, manufacturing, everything. It's kind of the think tank for the company. And so all the different departments that are defining the future of the company were housed there. And that was the whole purpose and point of the technical center being built. Now, were there any breakaway hits? I know, like, during the 60s, Ford had the Mustang Mm -hmm. that was a huge breakaway hit. Did GM have some of those? Well, certainly, certainly the Corvette, you know, Ah, would probably be the number one vehicle that people would remember. But, you know, in a way, I think that the definition of what vehicles were so important to that time that came out of the technical center really were the concept vehicles that came out because that was a new idea that was kind of, we think, was born from Harley Earl, who was the first vice president of design at General Motors. And he was the one who really came up with the idea of creating these one-of-a-kind vehicles that would capture the future thinking of the company and where they were going. And so these vehicles, you know, eventually all the car companies did that. But the vehicles that were designed during that time kind of really defined that era. And like the Firebird 1, 2, 3 models, oh, sure. those yeah. were all came out from the tech center. The LeSabre was probably designed at the Argonaut building in Detroit, but came out and Harley Earl actually used that as his vehicle. And so these one-of-a-kind, unbelievably beautiful and extraordinarily iconic vehicles, those are what I would look at as being the definition for what was going on at, at GM, you know, in terms of the technical center. Because really the technical center was defining the future for the company and really by default defining the future of much of what was going on in design in America. 
And who better to design all this but Saarinen, because he was all about the future. Yes, yeah. Uh, you wrote a book on this a couple of years ago. Yes. And tell us what's in the book. Well, let me tell you how the book came about. Sure. You know, because I think in a way that somewhat defines certain things. I'm a designer, and I did more than just design emblems and nameplates on cars and trucks. And my background is as a calligrapher and book designer. And so I was asked many times to create uh, special projects for different purposes, such as gifts for executives to give to people. Mm -hmm. or And one thing that I was asked to do was to design a uh, something to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Technical Center's opening. So this particular job really didn't have any definition to it. Mm -hmm. It was just something that I was asked to do to kind of just put a stake in the ground and tell that story. So I created this one-of-a-kind book for the executives at GM Design, and that really changed my career and ultimately led through all the research I did on both the Saarinen project as well as I just came across so much material that had to do with the history of design at General Motors that I ultimately proposed the forming of a department which was is called the General Motors Design Archive and Special Collections. And so that work that I started with kind of morphed into my job, which was the last 10 years of my time at General Motors. And in doing all this research that we ultimately came up with so much material that defined that project, the GM Tech Center, and it just became this obvious logical thing that there really wasn't that much written about that in the rest of the literature having to do with architecture. And it's really a unique project in the sense that Saarinen, I mean, the whole story is, you'll have to get the book and read it. It's right. really wonderful. But the whole story about this really was Aero Saarinen's first major commission. And it kind of was given to him in an unusual way because his father actually got the job initially. And then it was taken away because GM had some things that came up that changed the direction of the project and they put it on hold. When General Motors came back to Ilyil Saarinen to continue the project, he was too ill to continue. And so GM took a leap based on Harley Earl's faith in him as a young man. I think he was only 38 years old. He had no prior experience of running a giant project, project. such as that. And that was his first major commission, and he just took it on and really defined an era with his work. And that, you know, basically put him on the map, and all this other work came to him after that. And for the next, I guess, about six or seven years until he passed away early, yes, um, he was just on fire yes. with airports and... Yes. Other major commissions all around the country? Yeah, and he started all of that during the Tech Center project. And so he very much relied on his, uh, like Kevin Roche, who mm -hmm. was his right-hand man on that project, and Warren Plattner. I mean, Yamasaki was the head of Smith Hinchman and Grills, and he was the lead architect engineer on that project. So there were tons of really, you know, amazing and important mid-century designers that were involved in that project all the way through. You know, I think it's one of the most important projects in really in the history of America in terms of de defining an era. And, of course, Detroit was a nexus for mid-century designers and manufacturers of furniture, all kinds of other goods beyond, you know, the automotive industry. So later on in your career, besides being a designer, you became an archivist. Well, I didn't become an archivist. I directed the departments. So we did hire real archivists. Yeah. I would call myself a researcher, designer, writer, but I would never call myself an archivist. That's well, a separate ma you thing. Well, you managed the archivist, yes, right? Yes, I did. Okay. Yeah. That makes you an honorary archivist. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm an honorary. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a detriment because, to the field to say I'm an archivist. Because you know? that's just a, a tremendous gift to everybody to formally 
assemble this together. Yes, and I really have to acknowledge that the leadership at General Motors Design understood that this was something, you know, really when you think about it, American corporations are not very good at holding on to their history. No. And General Motors in particular has always been such a future-oriented company that nobody's really looking back. They're looking forward. And so in the moment that we proposed or I proposed this idea for this department, it really was kind of a counterintuitive thing that this would even happen because it was during the bankruptcy in 2009 that I proposed this. But I have to say that the GM leadership at the time at at Design really understood that they were sitting on a wealth of amazing documents and uh, materials that define their history with nobody really was pulling it together. Yeah, so it was kind of like this amazing cache of information that once somebody raised their hand and said, you know, let's do, do the right thing with this stuff, we developed this department, and now it's become really an, an integral part of the design process at GM because that department now, it basically puts on exhibitions with these materials. We've supported publications mm-hmm. such as Where Today Meets Tomorrow, the book about the tech center. But we also have done, as you are doing with your work, We have interviewed hundreds of former designers at General Motors to get their stories and understand what their experiences were. And, of course, many of those people, maybe not legally, but ended up with a lot of artifacts in their basements. Right. And we ended up, and this was actually one of the hardest parts about defining this department, is that a lot of these people knew that these materials were technically not theirs, but, you know, GM would have probably just thrown them Throw away. Them out. exactly. And so we spent a great deal of time gaining the trust of these retirees and former designers to let them know that we weren't in the business of, you know, confiscating anything. We were in the business of copying and understanding and assembly. And also, really, we were in the business of honoring these people that did hold on to our history, And And rescuing things from them being thrown away from their houses. Yes, exactly. And that took a little bit of maneuvering with the GM legal department. But ultimately, they uh, went with the logic there and allowed us to do this. And so basically, just to give you uh, a metric, is when we started off at the department, we really only had about 100 designer sketches for an almost 100-year-old company. Right. And in 10 years' time, and I'm sure the number is way higher now, but in 10 years' time, we documented over 20,000 designer sketches. Now you're talking, yeah. Yes. And so what ends up happening there, and it's all been documented and organized in such a way that so it's usable information at this point. So, for instance, if... Buick decides to, say, rebrand and revive a certain car from the 1978 or whatever, we can pull up information now that can help support these young designers who weren't even born then to understand the history of the brand and be able to design for it and understand it. So it's it's become a very important part of not only the design process, but also a very important part of defining the history of car design and in general. Also, like there's a show up right now at the Detroit Institute of Arts, one of the first major, it's the second actual major exhibition in Detroit on car design. And we were one of the major contributors to this in terms of supplying them with all of this material and and information and being a part of the planning committee and whatnot. So the department has kind of gained this status within the company that I think is, to me, um, I retired two years ago, and to me that's the most important thing that I did with my career. And the thing I'm most proud of is that this work that we did in the 10 years prior to my retiring was basically establish a department that's now become an integral part of 
their operations there. Well, what's so great about that story is in addition to being an honorary archivist, you're also a, a statesperson because you pulled off an amnesty yes. for all these people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Right? Yes. Essentially. Yes. To uh -huh. be able to return some of these materials and know they will be taken care of. Yes. Yeah. And, and that was no small feat because when you think about car design, these car designers, these guys that defined some of the most iconic aesthetics in American design in the 20th century, nobody knows who these folks are. Yeah. Right? Right. And so... Here we are pulling these guys in. Well, of course, these, I don't want to say these men have huge egos, but, you know, they worked for a company almost in secret their whole lives. And then when they leave, well, you can't really design a car on your own, you know, right. time yeah. in your basement. I mean, that has to happen within the context of a large corporation. So I cannot tell you how many times we pulled in uh, former designers and retired designers that literally were in tears in our office because somebody cared yes. enough to document their stories. And so to me, that was the most important work that continues on now. And I have to say that I think now, like even just in the 10 years that I worked on this type of thing, and I did a lot of designer interviews, Many of them have passed away. Right. And every week or two, I hear of another one. And I, I have to say that just a couple weeks ago, one of the most important women that worked uh, at the tech center passed away. And I was able to really have significant and important interviews with these people. So I feel wonderful that we got them. I mean, people that worked with Harley Earl mm -hmm. worked for Harley Earl. So those kinds of stories are things Irreplaceable. That, irreplaceable, and now they're gone. Yeah. You know? So we, I look back at these things, even now, it's, it's kind of like the World War II generation. Many of these people came back from the war and immediately got into this field, some with the GI Bill and whatnot, and also Harley Earl's prescience to actually go out into design schools and help develop their curriculum to be supportive of industrial design as a field. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it, the field is actually very new. You know, it's not even more than one and a half generations away. Yes. And so the idea that many of these mostly men and women are now leaving this world, it's so important that we were able to document their stories. And even... Here in Palm Springs about six years ago, I documented a gentleman who did work directly for Harley Earl, and I interviewed him a couple times. And I just have to say that these interviews I look back on now, and I just don't even think I understood at the moment how important they were. But I, I see now that it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get their words and stories on tape and understand that's how I feel all the time. I know. And that's why, I'm, that's why I'm sitting here. And so what you're doing is so important to get, these, to get these things down so that people understand them. You know, how can you understand the future if you don't understand the past? Well, on behalf of mid-century modernist fans everywhere, thank you so much and GM for that project, for keeping things together and allowing us to be able to find these materials for the future because the future is still bright at GM and certainly Saarinen's original vision for the campus is as good as it ever was. Yes, yeah, I agree. Well, thank you, George. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. That was my conversation with author Susan Skarsgård. Award-winning graphic designer Tom Dahl is one of the country's top visual communications, branding, and marketing specialists. He taught at Pratt, and he ran a New York City design firm for 35 years before moving to Palm Springs, where he's now creative director for Destination PSP. Jeff Stork is a classic car historian, writer, and researcher. He spent his career in the automobile industry with over 20 years marketing the big three car makers. He curates a large private automobile collection in Palm Springs. Note to self, gotta visit that. Their new book with a foreword by Susan Skarsgård is Glamour Road, Color, Fashion, Style, and the Mid-Century Automobile. 
We interviewed Tom and Jeff in Palm Springs during Modernism Week last February, but due to some highly technical problems, like my failing to push the red record button, <laughs> we are back in the studio talking to them via Zoom. Hey, thanks guys for bearing with us. Great to be here. Is this thing on? This thing is on. <laughs> yes. yes. It wasn't right. my fault. <laughs> We have all the backup systems in place, too, so right. so not to worry. It's okay. We had to do corrections to the book, too. Let's start with, Jeff, this car collection. Is this your car collection? No, it, it's a, a collection that I've helped assemble over the last 15 years for a long, long time friend who sort of retired, sold off his business, and decided it was time to build his dream garage and collect, you know, the significant cars of his youth, which basically means it's a fairly important post-war American diorama, if you will. I call it church parking lot 1957 because it's <laughs> it's the cars that people drove. It's not Ferrari, but it's Plymouths with tail fins and just the cars you saw in parking lots at that moment in time. Now, this person would not be a famous retired late night TV host, would he? It would not. It okay. would not. He's more of a muscle car person, and we're more of a post-war Americana. Got it. You know, the tritone four-door hardtop that your, you know, your favorite aunt actually drove. <laughs> I, I had some aunts and some great aunts like that, actually. And you may have borrowed her car and taken it out on a Saturday night and done things. It would be better. She'd never know. That kind of a <laughs> <laughs> Now, in addition to curating these, do you also have to work on them and fix them up, too? Oh yeah, some of them are. Some of them come to us as absolute wrecks. Okay. And some of them come just beautiful, and all they need is you know a little fluff. But and how many have you got now? Uh, like a golfer would say, the low eighties. Okay. You have eighty of them. The low eighties. The low. The did you low check? 80s. Did you check this morning? Because usually there's a new one every couple of days or things, so. Things do arrive. I will admit, I am not expecting any transport trucks this week. Where the hell do you put them all? We we have a hanger. Okay, oh, that's a uh, hanger. hanger. That's an that's adequate. Awesome. That's an adequate size. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I think I gotta have a hanger for something. Tom, where's our plane? By the way, <laughs> have you have you checked on that lately? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's taxiing here. <laughs> Tell us about the book. I've seen it. It's it's really lovely, and and the photography is particularly good. Tom, how did the book get started with you and Jeff? <laughs> Am I telling this story, Jeff? <laughs> yeah, I think I'm introducing the story and then you can take it over. The okay. story started with a message on Facebook Messenger that said, hi, my name is Tom Dahl and I want to write a book. And everything about the post-war industry that I've read and liked, you wrote. Would you be interested? Okay, and I'm going to stop the conversation right here and say, if you get a message from Tom Dahl saying he wants to write a book, just take all that energy you were going to put into fighting him off and start writing because you're going to end up doing it. That's good to know. I was a little relentless because I I had done a show at Pratt many years ago. I was one of those kids like Jeff was, too, although he was much more than I was. But I was one of those kids that dragged my parents to the car dealers every fall to look at all the new cars. And I picked up all the brochures and I would I would pour over them and study them. And it actually led to a whole career in graphic design, which I didn't realize at the time and actually didn't really put the dots together until we did the book where I realized that was sort of my beginning. And I did a show at Pratt of all of the brochures that I had. And it was really fascinating to see all of the artwork and the design and the incredible attention to graphic design and photography and illustration that was going on in these pieces. So I knew I wanted to do something that honored that. And Although there's tons of car books out there about all kinds of pieces of the car world, there didn't seem to be anything that focused on that and specifically what we ended up with, which was the whole glamour connection. And so when I looked around and I saw things that were out there, I saw Jeff's work and I said, here's someone who I think is on the same track. And I was still in New York at the time, but I was coming back and forth to Palm Springs and we finally met up and we talked about doing a book and we weren't quite sure. And we kind of came up with a few things. And then the other part of the story, why don't you go to the next part of the story, Jeff? Basically, the reason I think it, we worked together so well is we both saw the industry from a very similar viewpoint. Tom was a designer for 30 years. I was a marketer. So we both created elements to market the cars. Really, it's a sizzle book. It's not about horsepower and, you know, zero to 60 numbers. It's about 
you know, the sizzle that sold the steak. Sex appeal. Yes. Tom had a vacation home in Palm Springs. So when he came out here, we actually met in person and discovered that that we were kind of kindred spirits in many ways. And he was doing a house tour, was it? Yeah, it was a house tour. When we bought our house, it was already signed up for a house tour like four months later. So I had to scramble to kind of get it together and actually have the house ready to show. But it's on a cul-de-sac and it was uh, William Kreisel Houses in Canyon View Estates. Uh, very significant, 1964, Claire Story windows, the uh, pattern block, you know, the whole the whole Palm Springs architectural style was right there in this one community. And it was totally attacked. So Tom says, well, I'm going to put my car in the driveway, my Pontiac convertible. And would you bring a couple cars over and maybe put them on either side? And I did. I grabbed a couple cars. I grabbed a, an Oldsmobile with tail fins and a classic Buick Riviera. And we put them on either side and we kind of watched people's reaction. And we sort of looked out Tom's kitchen window. And all I saw was the early 60s. And I just kind of turned to, maybe we both had the moment, but I turned to Tom and said, I have a terrible idea. What if we filled the entire cul-de-sac with classics? And that kind of led to the germ of the cul-de-sac experience because then it was like, okay, and we put everybody in period attire and we get music of the correct era and we just sort of create, I think he calls it a time capsule. I call it sensory deprivation. But we take the entire neighborhood back to the early 60s for a day. It is time travel. I can completely see that. It is. Yeah. As soon as you step out the front door, you're wearing a fedora. Yeah. yeah you see just, nothing new. We mask it off. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is because it's a cul-de-sac, it's sort of a little theater in the round. Right. So all of this is in front of you and you're looking at the whole thing. And it really is like a stage set. And in all fairness, we do it to this incredible level of detail where the cars have vintage fake license plates and the homes that are on tour have vintage for sale signs in front of them that say open house, come on in. And, you know, it's just done to a to a very high level of detail right down to the custom branding on our ice cream sandwiches. So cul-de-sac well, kind of got us down the road to really realizing how cars were such an important part of the mid-century experience. And, you know, so often car shows and car collections are in a parking lot somewhere with the hoods up. And, you know, it's looking at them as, as objects in a parking lot. And we really saw vintage cars as part of the modernism experience. And, and sort of our goal was to continually showcase how cars were part of culture and a, and a big part of culture. And when you take a mid-century house and you put an appropriate car in front of it, and by the way, it's not just any car, even of that era. You wanna pick the car that the owner of that house probably would have driven. So a modest house probably wouldn't have a Cadillac in front of it and a luxurious house probably wouldn't have a Falcon in front of it. Mm -hmm. So that level of detail, when you start to get to that point, you really are capturing the essence of what was going on culturally in that moment. As a restorer, I'm going to say that, you know, my goal is to make the car as exact to how it was when it was originally delivered. Because the car is, to me, it's a snapshot. If you don't change it, it doesn't change. It represents a fixed moment in time. So when you get a few of them together, again, carefully curated, authentic, then you can start to accessorize them and you start to tell a much larger story. You begin to tell a story of what a neighborhood was like at a moment in time, which is which is much more exciting. This is almost like doing production design, right? It if is. You're, if you're outfitting a neighborhood with the cars and the signs and everything. Have any TV or movie people approached you about building a neighborhood? <laughs> As a matter of fact, not on our cul-de-sac, but on the next cul-de-sac over, which is part of the same community, that Harry Styles movie was filmed last year, two years ago, and it's going to debut right before the cul-de-sac that we're going to do again in October. That's going to be a big studio movie that's totally filmed in our neighborhood. We can comment later about whether they got the cars right, but in the meantime, they totally transformed the neighborhood into an even better version of what we were doing. Okay. And after three years of cul-de-sac, we're not saying that there was no relationship between inspiration and, and, and action. Now, gentlemen, which had more impact on mid-century car design, World War II or the interstate highway system? Mm, the interstate highway system. World War II created a pent-up demand, which allowed for certain opportunities. That meant there was a period of time where people would buy anything, okay? Even some of the independents we talk about in the book that had relatively short lives, 
because there was a moment where they would people would buy anything just to have a car. But that's that's short lived and that's over by about 1949. The interstate highway system caused basically a redesign of the car to be capable of sustained high speeds, which is something that the pre-war cars weren't asked to do. And it also changed the role of the car. It made the car more of a traveling companion than it had been before the war. So I think it probably had more of a sustained and lasting influence. And with the growth of the suburbs, I mean, the interstate highway system really encouraged the suburbs to grow. And that's the the real key to a big part of our book is there was an entirely new market as couples and young families moved out to the suburbs, suddenly they needed a second car. And that second car was usually for the woman of the house. So the car companies had this entirely new market that they really had no idea how to approach, which was women drivers. And women started making a lot more decisions about what cars were purchased in the family. Well, they had always had a role in that. But after the war, in the brand new suburbs, there weren't supermarkets yet. There weren't bus lines, so they had to have a car to go to the store to feed the family. So this is a vehicle that was for her use. So she's going to have a much greater influence over the vehicle that is for her to drive. And that meant that automobile companies had to actually teach salespeople how to talk to these people. And still at the time, though, it was mostly men making these decisions, right? The women didn't come into this picture until later at the big three. Well, there, there aren't women around, certainly working in the big three in any substantial numbers at that moment. But they're starting, to, it's, it's very interesting time if you look at advertising, they're starting to reach out to appeal to women, but they really don't know how to talk to them. And that's, wow. it's wow. kind of fun. It's kind of tragic. It's a little of both, but it makes for a very interesting chapter. And you have a whole chapter about this called Designing Women. Well, Designing Women is actually about the early women designers in the auto industry that actually worked on product to make product more comfortable, easier to use, and more attractive to women. That General Motors was sort of the lead on that. They hired an actual team of female designers. And they worked primarily in interiors, but again, their goal is to make the product more friendly, to make sure that you know the seats don't snag nylons and the controls are easy to use and that you know the car is appealing. Women were such a, an important force at that time, but as we stated, the car companies didn't really know how to approach them. But there must have been a light bulb moment where they discovered that fashion was the vehicle that, pardon the pun, the vehicle that would, uh, number one, appeal to women and also permit them to change cars every year, make them new and fresh every year which means that the ones from a year or two ago were not going to look as fresh. And there you have planned obsolescence. I mean, planned obsolescence is really what propelled the American culture, in the, in, especially in the 50s and 60s. And the car companies were sort of colluding with the fashion industry because they both had the same goal. We want to have continual change of product and continual renewal, which means people have to buy the new stuff all the time. Which is why I kind of call the cars dresses made of steel. Because really, it's a fashion statement. It's just made of metal. They have a new fall color palette. They have new spring colors. They have a new look in the fall. It's all the fashion merchandising techniques that are simply applied to the auto industry. And it's worth noting that it wasn't just automobiles that adapted these techniques. Look at the appliance industry. During the war, you have an assembly line that makes bombs. Okay, after the war, not so much demand for bombs, but a big need for toasters. So suddenly they start making toasters. But to keep people to buy new toasters when they have perfectly good ones already, you've got to have styling changes. The toaster has to, has to come in color. You have to come up with a four slice model. You have to do all of these product innovations to create planned obsolescence in appliances to keep the appliance assembly lines going. Exactly, because, you know, you don't want people to just buy one toaster and hold on to it for 20 years. The sad truth is it will last that long if you let it. Yeah. But wasn't there at some point later on where they were engineering components that fail after five years, or am I going off in a different direction? That's less clear. What is clear is that they would attempt to entice you to the newer, bigger, better, new color, exciting model. Because, you know, if you invite the ladies over for tea and they see your toaster... They're not going to know that Harry hasn't been getting much overtime. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I get it. Now, when I think of breakthrough successes for mid-century cars, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is the famous Mustang. 
What were some of the other models that were really wildly successful? Well, if you look at things where all the arrows lined up, I think the first step you've got to come to is the 1955 Chevrolet. And it's an interesting story because Chevrolet was General Motors bread and butter. It was a good, dependable car with a reliable six-cylinder engine. And people knew what to expect of Chevy. And then in the, in the early 50s, they started to kind of do some things that were a little out of character, that they brought out a two-seat sports car called Corvette. It doesn't matter that it was still powered by a six-cylinder inline engine. It was very sexy, and it was outside of the mold. And that led to an all-new 1955 Chevrolet, which was completely redesigned in and out with a V8 engine and totally modern drivetrain. And that was sort of the beginning of the modern Chevrolet. And that car was a phenomenal, phenomenal success. I think another one that, particularly for designers, you know, it's 1961 Lincoln. You know, the Continental was just the most beautiful design with the four-door convertible with the suicide doors, the slab sides. It sort of defined the whole um, Kennedy era. What's a suicide door? It opens the, the opposite way. Yeah, Lincoln called him center opening. The other is a nickname. But oh, it means that okay. the two door handles basically meet. One door swings one way, one door swings the opposite direction. So theoretically, if you were pushing on the rear door of the car, it could come open and you could fall out. And that was considered a suicidal moment. Yeah, um, okay. It's worth noting that power door locks were standard on all of those four-door Continentals. Oh, that's good. That particular car is a, is, is a watershed for several reasons. The designer, he called the car Audrey Hepburn in a simple black dress with a single strand of pearls. And I think that's a pretty apt description. The car is not over adorned with chrome. It's severely simple in ornamentation. And it's just the shape is beautiful. I remember in those Lincolns that the, the trunk was enormous. Unless you had a convertible. And then the top took up pretty much the whole thing. Okay. Yeah, okay. There, was, there was a little tiny compartment in the middle of the trunk where you could fit a suitcase. <laughs> that was it. They wanted the beauty of the completely disappearing top. They didn't want Jackie Kennedy snapping on a vinyl top boot. Right. So they designed this beautiful, very complicated, fully disappearing top, and it was fantastic. But it took up pretty much the whole trunk. When you talk about fashion, though, that car really represented how fashion triumphed. The Lincolns and Continentals before that were, uh, especially in the late 50s, were gaudy. They were huge. They were kind of bloated. I mean, we love them now because they're so eccentric, but they were they were pretty vulgar in their time. And 61 came out and it was just the most elegant thing you could imagine. And it changed fashion. I mean, that's when fashion changed. It was Oleg Cassini and, and shift dresses and pillbox hats and, and a much more subdued and sophisticated look of fashion, and it aligned perfectly with what was going on with the Continental. And in a, in a foreshadowing of what would come in the future, it was actually downsized. The 61 Continental was about a foot shorter than a 60. So it was a downsized luxury car, but no one saw less of it because it was smaller. They admired the package and they bought it. So lessons to come. I wanted to get you guys' opinion on something. What I remember growing up that was supposed to be like the big fashion moment, the the car that was going to be the breakthrough in automobiles, just totally different than anything else, was the AMC Pacer. <laughs> what happened with that? Why, why didn't that work? Well, it's a long, it, it, I'll give you the shortest version possible. Yeah. The Pacer is a bit newer than the book. That'll be something we'll cover in the sequel. Yeah, this was okay. the 70s, wasn't it? It was the 70s. American Motors was trying to design a very, very, very roomy commuter car with a compact exterior. And to make it all work, they had a contract to buy the two-rotor Wankel rotary engine that General Motors was in the process of tooling. And it was a very small compact engine that would fit way up in the front of the Pacer, and it would give it basically the interior room of a Chevy Impala, which is very, you know, groundbreaking. Yeah, spacious. And then General Motors canceled the rotary project, and the Pacer was already about half-tooled over at Bud, so, which was the, the body supplier. So it was too late to scrap it. They couldn't afford to scrap it. They had to adapt an existing engine to the Pacer. And the only engine they had to choose from was an inline six-cylinder engine, which was 27 inches longer than the rotary. Oh. So that wow. meant they had to push the whole firewall back, which is why the car has this really huge dashboard. It's, it's trying to hide the fact that the engine is right there. <laughs> and to make that work, the front seats got pushed back. The rear seats got pushed back. All the interior specifications were simply ruined. And all they had left was 
the car was wide, which is why when it debuted, they introduced it as the first wide, small car yeah. and ran an ad showing a man making a three foot long sandwich in the back seat. Because wide <laughs> is all they had left. <laughs> For all the times you have to make a sandwich in the back seat of a car. If you're a sandwich maker, we got your car. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I remember that the Wankel engine was really big about Mazda. And they oh, had yeah. Mazda. Mazda brought it on board. Yes. Has it survived at all? Do any cars use that anymore? Not in the present time, but Mazda keeps bringing it back for performance models. Um, okay. For its size, it was a very powerful engine for its size. It had two problems, though, in the 70s. It wasn't terribly fuel efficient, and it wasn't good on emissions. Oh. In the 60s, it might have been a success, but that wasn't the right engine for the 70s for a new line of General Motors cars. So this is starting to sound like a car show. I'm going to bring it back to fashion a little bit. Okay. (laughs) Because AMC is actually a great story because they were some of the first that came out with designer editions. Again, it's his early 70s, but you had the Gucci Sportabout, the Hornet Sportabout, and the uh, Pierre Cardin Javelin, which I am very proud to say I own, um, which had... Striped seats and headliner and badging of Pierre Cardin in pink and purple and orange and And silver and silver. And it's quite something. And they really were taking risks. This was a small company that didn't have a lot of money. They couldn't tool or compete with some of the engineering prowess of the of the big three. But they were really going on style and fashion. And a lot of this started with Mary Wells of Wells Rich and Green, which was sort of the uh, model for um, what's her name in Mad Men? Uh, Peggy. Peggy, yeah, Peggy and Mad Men. She was one of the first big advertising executives that that really created the look of the late 60s. And what she did for AMC was groundbreaking. And it really got them through at least 10 good years. And then um, it sort of fizzled after that. But Well, she uh, did for AMC what she had done for Braniff. She rebranded Braniff. She was the Braniff lady, yes. Yes. She was the brand of lady, the end of the plain plane. She painted the planes lavender. She brought in designers to redesign the interiors and the uniforms for the flight attendants. She did the same thing with American Motors. It started as a show car in 1970, and the car it was a Gucci sportabout, but it was a really crazy one with a full leather interior and gold grill and all this crazy stuff. And it made it to the showrooms for $124 extra. And it was successful enough to keep rolling with it. And, you know, when you think about the 70s, you think about the designer jeans with the label on the pocket. It was perfect. (laughs) My mind is just reeling now, gentlemen, just all these memories of different car things just coming back. And that's one of the things I really like about the book. The book is Glamour Road, Color, Fashion, Style, and the Mid-Century Automobile. Thank you so much for talking with us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. George was chatting with Tom Dahl and Jeff Stork, auto historians. Returning podcast guest Eric Bricker is an art consultant turned documentary filmmaker. He was born in St. Louis, but is now based in Austin, Texas. He studied theater at Indiana University and Cal State Long Beach. Eric directed Visual Acoustics, the modernism of Julius Schulman. Eric joined us poolside to discuss Illumination, a history of the Airstream trailer and the devoted families who traveled the world with it, a film which premiered in 2021. Eric has been a guest on the show before, and we're here at Palm Springs, sitting by the pool after a wonderful breakfast. And Eric, I know that you have some real fans now. In fact, there are a couple people out here who really got inspired by your first movie about Julia Shulman. And they've been following you around. You're like fanboys and girls. That must be fun. <laughs> it's been it's fun. I never imagined that type of thing happening. But hey, we're in Palm Springs. Anything can happen. Yeah. So the movie you've been making most recently, Illumination, is all about the Airstream, which most everybody has seen somewhere riding down the road. But it has a much longer history than most people know. So tell us how it started. Sure. The film is called Illumination, and it is actually finished. We started it, my producing partner, Lisa Hughes, who was also executive producer on visual acoustics, came up with this idea of, hey, how about we do a documentary on Airstream travel trailers as a follow-up to visual acoustics? And she was looking at it from a design standpoint. And when she proposed it to me, it was an immediate yes. 
That's how it started. Yes. And how did the Airstream itself come about? Yes. Um, wow. Well, that's that's a long story, and we've captured it in here. So in, <laughs> yes. he's, he's, pointing to a, he's pointing to the movie yes. card in front of him. <laughs> yes. That's why I would love for everybody to go see that, because that will give you the history. But to give you a quick thumbnail. Yeah, the elevator version. Yeah, yeah. the elevator version. Let me see. I'm going to try to do it in 30 seconds or less, because there's so much to it, and I've been immersed in this world. Tom, insert ticking sound here. And then, um, okay, where were we? Airstream, history of Airstream. Airstream trailers came about through the founder, Wally Byam. Wally had built a trailer basically out of wood masonite and, and leatherette. And there was another trailer company. It was Bolus Trailer Company. And that was developed by Holly Bolus, who was also in the aviation world. And he applied the idea of basically aviation engineering to a trailer. And so the Airstream that we know today is a combination of that idea of you know, a monocoque shell built out of aluminum. Wally Byam saw that, took that concept, and then put that into Airstream travel trailers. And they grew. They got longer. Yeah, um, Eventually. Yes, they did. They did grow. So when when did he begin making these trailers out of aluminum? Wally Byam began building aluminum trailers in the early 30s. I think you know the company okay. was founded in 1932, and I think the first because they weren't building the aluminum trailers yet. I believe the first aluminum trailer was brought to market from Airstream. That is in 1936. Okay, so before that, they were mostly these wood masonite contraptions. Is this is in the middle of the Depression. Yeah. Um, Wally was a really industrious guy. And, I mean, the whole story, which, again, this is all in the film, he built his first travel trailer in the backyard of his home. This was in 1929. He loved camping, had a whole outdoor background, wanted to make it more comfortable for his wife, his reluctant wife, <laughs> as we say in the film. <laughs> And she didn't want to travel? No, she wasn't into the camping thing. There's a uh -huh. really brilliant photo of her sitting by the campfire, arms folded with kind of a dour look on her face. Like and Bernie Sanders at, at the inauguration? <laughs> That's yeah. exactly it. Mm. And then there's Wally over there at the campfire doing some things. <laughs> um, but it was a hit. Like He took this thing out on the road, and people said, hey, where did you get that? How did you? And he's like, I built it myself. So he saw the reaction out there. And ended up selling the plans for his trailer in Popular Mechanics magazine. So he was just selling the plans. And those were kind of the seeds for Airstream. And one other thing that I want to say, so even again, this is during the Depression, but Wally was already in the publishing business. He had a number of different trade magazines. He had a number of different things that I think fed him during the Depression. And that was he had some engineering ability. He had marketing ability. He was an entrepreneur. So he did okay. Doing that time. A lot of side gigs. Yes. So if you don't know what we're talking about, the Airstream is that sort of silver capsule-looking object that you see being pulled behind a car on the highways. It's been going there for decades. And it always grabs your attention. I mean, I remember seeing the first ones of these on Highway 258 in North Carolina going, wow, what is that? Mm -hmm. And my parents would tell me, oh, that's a trailer. They didn't know the name of it, but they knew it was a fancy trailer that people had. And they perceived it as to be like the, the Cadillac of trailers. Like, you just couldn't get any better than an Airstream trailer. Was that true? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was from its inception, it was started as a luxury travel trailer. And that, that was the whole idea behind it. And just going back to the, the sense of nostalgia, you know, it, it seems like every generation including my son, who's in Generation Z, it seems like it's emblazoned in their minds that, oh, yeah, I've seen those things back when I was a kid. I mean, my son is 17. So it seems like <laughs> yeah. it's for somehow, it's like really captured the imagination yes. of well, everyone. It looks a little bit like a rocket ship. So there's a certain sort of like retro space age note to it. Definitely. It's timeless. Russ Bannum, who's a writer, uh, and he's in the film, he talks about, he says... The Airstream design is timeless, and you really shouldn't tinker with that. Mm -hmm. And again, that goes back to, I think, the brilliance of Wally Byam, who was so vigilant in terms of 
standards for design, standards for engineering, and he really came up with something absolutely brilliant. And to this day, they still retain that same shape. So one of the things that I found fascinating about your film, Eric, is that somehow you happen on all these home movies of people who were taking these things all around the world. I mean, oh, like yeah, I taking guess. them across oceans to go on vacations. How, how did all those films come about? That's an interesting story. We found those in the Airstream archive. When we started the film, we thought we were making a film on more of the contemporary aspects of people Airstreaming today. And there was not, there was an adequate amount of archival footage but they didn't have enough archival footage for us to really use that as the central narrative through the film. So we had been working on this thing for years. It wasn't cutting together. It was like, it was reality television at best. Until I saw in the summer, I think it was 2016, I saw a new Airstream spot that was made and I saw a bunch of archival footage in there. Oh. And I reached out to Airstream and said, hey, is there some new footage that I haven't seen? And the answer was yes. And it was like, five times the amount of archival footage that I had access to before. That became the central narrative. We were able to capture Wally on screen as well as all of these incredible caravans. So just to add to the caravan piece of it, a lot of that footage was, quote, home footage from actual caravanners that were on those caravans and that were saved by the Wally Byam Club the current day historian had learned about some of this footage and got it from some of the families. So, and then was donated to the Airstream archive. A caravan, I think of as it's a British term for a trailer. The in the, the, in the Middle East, is, yeah, yeah, there's a string of them going it, together. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah, in Europe, it's a caravan is the, oh. is a trailer. Right. In this context, a caravan is a string of trailers oh, and all going together to the same place that's right and they went like the circus <laughs> yes it was like a traveling circus uh-huh. and i i know wally would agree with that it was very difficult to manage at times and he was the ringleader but they literally went all over the world there was even a around the world caravan so did the company sponsor trips like this as sort of a cross promotion thing yeah, it's um, marketing brilliance. Yeah, Wally aspired to live this life. So in a way, he built this trailer and he built this company as a platform to live what he was inspired to do. So the caravans were a combination of a, a, a couple of different things. Number one, it was getting the product out in the field and basically test marketing it. Mm-hmm. And number two he would bring people along on these caravans to show them how you can use your trailer and also it would generate marketing content. Yes. So the quintessential caravan is the 1959 to 1960 Cape Town, South Africa to Cairo, Egypt caravan. Oh. And they made a, they made a movie out of that. And that is the central caravan so we focus th- on. This is not just like people going from you know, Alabama to Missouri on a long weekend. I mean, this is serious adventuring. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is, you know, Alabama to Missouri. There's a number of different caravans that happen in the States. But yeah, I mean, they, again, they did an around the world caravan. And this was in a time before interstate highways. I mean, this was a time where you were taking, I guess, assume there were pickup trucks mostly or heavy-duty vehicles that were towing these airstreams That's through. right, because they weren't, they weren't self-propelled like a Winnebago. That's they right. Yeah, these are trailers, yeah. Through roads that were hardly roads. Yeah, I mean, it's all, again, it's in the documentary. You look at the footage, you look at, I mean, there are times when they had to make their own roads to get through certain spots, you know? <laughs> a road might get washed out. I mean, it's, it's, it was intense. It's and, a vacation. It's a public works project. Yes. It's everything. <laughs> and they had to take parts. Too. Oh, yes. In order to repair themselves uh-huh. when they were doing these trips. Okay. So it really is a high adventure kind of living. It appeals to a certain sort of DIYer, I guess. Yeah, but I think, you know, in contrast to, it's just like there's people who just want to maybe get out for the weekend, or there's people in, nowadays who have them, they don't leave their backyard. It's a, it's a guest house. Yeah. 
So there's a number of different applications. I think the one time I stayed in an Airstream, it was parked next to somebody's cabin, and it was a guest house, essentially. Yeah, there are lots of people now who are in them full time and live in communities with them, and you, yeah. you see them in uh, tr- or traditional mobile home parks, but you see them in other places and little communities that are all parked together. It's astonishing. Now, the current day Airstreams that are being put out now, what kind of features do they have that they didn't have back in the 50s? The ultimate trailer that Wally Byam was wanting to create was a self-contained environment. So you have all your needs met. You've got cooking, you know, water, you have a toilet, everything that you need to actually live. In this day and age, they, they're self-contained, but the systems are just modernized and much more efficient. But mm-hmm. again, like I think going back to how brilliant Byam was, it was in a way he almost like by keeping it minimal, keeping it to just the basic systems that you need, he kind of future-proofed it. And then in modern-day conveniences, like having an electric jack, for instance, instead of having you know, to sit there and twist crank, it. Crank yeah, it up. Crank it up. Yeah, you press a button and the electric jacks. So there's a lot of modern conveniences that have been added on top of the basic systems. Are there still these round-the-world trips? I'm not aware of any international type of caravans going on right now. There are a lot of domestic caravans and through Canada... Um, But I know there's a lot of different groups who have talked about wanting to get back out there. And there was even talk years ago of Cape Town to Cairo, but just kind of knowing the geography there, it's a little Well, and the politics. Yep. And COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But that'll all pass eventually, Mm -hmm. right? Hopefully. I hope so. Yes. Now, in trying to understand the the zeitgeist of Airstream, how does this all fit in with the mid-century modern vibe. So, I mean, looking at the design for myself, the way that it fits in, is in the Airstream design, there's a sense of minimalism. They're exposed materials. There's, there's no type of embellishment on top of the material. It's just aluminum and rivets and the simplicity and the, you know, the minimalism for me creates a space where I feel like the person, the people that are in the space, activate it and come together. And I feel that same thing when I visit a Neutra home or, you know, like any type of modern home. I feel that same type of thing that I'm almost in a way the primary focal point, not the house. Where can people see the movie? We've got a couple of different film festivals coming up right now. Um, but we do have our distributor for visual acoustics is actually getting ready to put it out. So we're talking about it right now. We don't have the distribution path set, but it will come out sometime this year. We actually just screened at Palm Springs you know, at Modernism Week, and we're hoping there might be an encore presentation. Oh, awesome. Now, I have to ask this question. Did Airstream ever put out a toy version of this for kids to have little Airstreams to play with? That's, that, that's a great question. I don't know if it was Airstream that put it out, But that is a gift that I actually have for you. I actually have that. (laughs) Wow. Yes. And I didn't bring it because I didn't want to. Psychics today. Really? That's so wild. I didn't (laughs) didn't bring it because I thought you have so much stuff to take back. So Uh I'm going to mail it to you. (laughs) Okay. I have a die cast. You're going to love it. I thought this is George. Yeah. 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 Okay. You could have hooked it to the back of your car and driven it home. (laughs) That's right. Had you not On my plane. Yes. (laughs) Well, wonderful. That's good to know. Yeah. That, That would be such a cool thing to have on a desk. You know, Mm -hmm. just looking at that little Airstream. Right. And you could put mints in it or something. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much, Eric, for coming by. And this is a great movie. Everybody should go see this. Excellent. It's just inspiring. Whether you like to camp or not, you should see this. Yeah. Wally's wife, she didn't like to camp. That was his first wife. Oh. oh. (laughs) (laughs) And on that note, (laughs) thank you, Eric. George and I were just chatting with Eric Bricker, the creator of Illumination. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. And by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. Want to go with us to Modernism Week in 2023 and stay with us at the U.S. Modernist Compound? Email me, george at usmodernist.org. Okay, Tom, take us out. 
Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 15,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Rogue archivist Carrie Cesarino researched all the guests for our Modernism Week interviews. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I'll be back soon with another sitting by the pool, looking at the mountains, drinking martinis, talking architecture edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Modernist Radio.